Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully, um, you guys can hear us and are able to see us and see our screen. Um, we're, we're really happy to be able to share this series with all of you. I know that these are very troubling times, and um, we, uh, we really are appreciative that our professional partner um, and, and actually um, member of 2030 District, Malink, has offered to um, give us some of their insights as to how to um, deal with some of the indoor air qualities as it relates to um, HVAC systems. So um, with that, uh, I'll just give you a couple little pointers in case you're not uh, used to Zoom. We have a mute button. I think everybody comes in automatically muted and your video off. Please keep the mute button off. Um, please mute yourselves. And, um, but feel free to sh share your, your, your face with us today. We'd be happy to see you. Um, during the presentation, we will have um, the opportunity to put any questions that you have into the chat box. And um, we will be monitoring those questions. If you have a, quest a question that you'd like to ask at the end of the meeting, you can unmute yourself and ask the question and then please mute yourself again afterward. So um, with that, I would like to introduce Darren Witter, Vice President of Malink and Cameron Leonard. Um, he's our, the business developer. Um, and so I would, um, I'd like to hand it over to them and um, enjoy the presentation and please feel free to ask questions in the chat box again. Let's all mute our, ourselves when we're not talking. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. This is Darren Witter speaking. I'll go ahead and kick things off. And uh, thank you also to all of our 2030 district members and other guests joining us today. We're very excited to be here to discuss the importance of indoor air quality and the role it plays in your company. So in this session, we're um, going to do uh, several things. Uh, first, we'll define what indoor air quality is. Uh, we'll also share some common factors of indoor air quality. We'll discuss the impacts of IAQ on employee health and performance, as well as its effects on building health. We'll also discuss uh, the impacts that IAQ has on energy use, uh, which is important to our goal of 50% energy reduction by 2030. And finally, we'll share some ways to promote good IAQ in your facilities. All right, Cam, you wanna advance a couple slides there? Uh, I'm not sure if you're seeing what I'm seeing here. We on the net zero page? Uh, keep going. Okay. Mm. There we go, thank you. Alrighty, so I'd like to start with a couple of definitions. Uh, the first being indoor air quality or IAQ. So what exactly does that mean when we, when we say IAQ? Well, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, defines indoor air quality as the air quality within and around buildings and structures, especially as it relates to the health and comfort of building occupants. And the EPA has also identified indoor air quality as one of the top five most urgent environmental risks to public health. So it's a very important topic. And indoor air quality is based on many factors, such as the temperature of the indoor air, and even the speed or the velocity of that air, uh, the humidity or the moisture content of the indoor air, uh, the air pressure inside the building, and also what is in, in the air, such as carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds or VOCs, and particulates such as dust, pollen, bacteria, and more. And we'll get into why each of those are significant a bit later in this presentation. Uh, the next definition is HVAC, which stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And by this, we're referring to the mechanical systems that control the breathable air in the occupied spaces of your facility. In other words, it's the indoor environment. And the primary functions of an HVAC system are to control temperature in the space, which is the heating and the cooling of the air. 
to control moisture in the space by either humidifying or dehumidifying the air to provide ventilation, which is the introduction of fresh outside air into the building, and also the removal of polluted air out of the building. And the ventilation rates of a building and even the individual spaces within that building will vary by the number of occupants and also how the space is being utilized. The HVAC system controls the pressurization of the building and the various spaces within it. Also, the HVAC system filters the air to remove the particulates that are suspended in the air. Okay, so this is a simple illustration of an HVAC system. Uh, first, we have fresh outside air that's being brought into the building. And for our example, let's say it's 5,500 CFM. And CFM is a unit of flow, which stands for cubic feet per minute. The HVAC system then filters that outside air. It heats or cools, and then also may hu humidify or dehumidify that air to make it comfortable for the building occupants. Now, meanwhile, we have exhaust fans that are pulling the polluted air out of the building, such as from restrooms or perhaps kitchen cooking areas. And for our illustration, let's call it 5,000 CFM of exhaust. So the difference between these two creates a pressure in the building, which in our example is 500 CFM. The difference in our case is positive, meaning that we have more air coming into the building than we have leaving it. And a positive pressure is desired because it helps to keep unfiltered and untempered outdoor air from working its way into the building through doors and cracks in, in the building envelope. In addition, the HVAC system is controlling the pressure of individual spaces inside the building. So for example, the restrooms should be negatively pressurized relative to the adjacent spaces so that the air migrates into the restrooms and not out. Now, People have different sensitivity, uh, sensitivities around what they feel is comfortable and acceptable. And because of this, it creates some subjectivity with indoor air quality. Fortunately, there are organizations that have studied the importance of IAQ and have developed various standards and guidelines for us to use. A few of those are here. Uh, first, ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. ASHRAE has written standard 62, ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality. And this standard outlines minimum ventilation rates and other measures to provide indoor air quality that is acceptable to occupants. And that minimizes the adverse health effects. Standard 62 is recognized and referenced by many codes and jurisdictions as the authoritative standard in the area of ventilation. ASHRAE has also written standard 55, thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy. This standard provides guidance on things such as air temperature, humidity, and airspeed, and their effects on human comfort and health. ASHRAE also has a useful guide dedicated specifically to the subject of indoor air quality. The US Green Building Council's LEED rating system even awards points for increased ventilation and for performing an indoor air quality assessment, either by flushing out contaminated air in the building with a prescribed amount of fresh outside air, or by testing the indoor air quality to verify that it meets acceptable levels. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, has a useful guide for indoor air quality in commercial and institutional buildings. It provides common sources of indoor air pollutants and ways to prevent and control IAQ problems. Also, the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 has a section referred to as the General Duty Clause, which requires employers to furnish its employees with a place of employment that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious harm. And this would certainly apply to the indoor air quality. Furthermore, the Centers for Disease Control and NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, 
concludes that improper operation and maintenance of HVAC systems is one of the most common problems that impact workplace and door environmental quality. And with that, I'm gonna hand things off to Cameron who's, who will discuss employee health and the ways to improve indoor air quality. Cameron? Thank you, Darren. So indoor air pollution is a global problem in need of a local solution. And I think this is a, a pretty powerful quote um, and it's the average adult spends 90% of their time indoors and that same air can be two to five times more polluted than outside air. So I know for me, um, I used to always think that outside air being you know, near cars and near a train station or whatever it may be was always very polluted. Um, but per the EPA, you can actually see that indoor air tends to be more polluted than your typical outside air. And going off of that, a uh, quote from the World Health Organization, that 3.8 million premature deaths annually from non-communicable diseases, including stroke, ischemic heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and lung cancer are all attributed to exposure to household air pollution. So this is a very real problem. Um, you know, you may think that your indoor air is, is very um, clean and non-polluted, um, but it can actually really lead to a number of health issues down the road if it is polluted. And this graph right here is uh, from the well, uh, is from well, and it talks about uh, the cost analysis of building spend versus personal, personnel spend um, over 30 years of a building. And if you look at this, 92% of a company's spend is going toward employee wages and benefits. So it's really toward the employees over this time period. And really the um, condition of the building directly impacts the employees. So if you have um, poor indoor air quality, you could have to be spending more money on uh, for health insurance and for um, sick time and other issues that may be arising down the road. So I'll do a little bit deeper dive here on employee health. So per the WHO, um, poor ventilation in facilities is associated with increased disease transmission. So the way I like to think about this is if you're in a small office space with someone who has a cold or is sick in some way, you are far more likely to get sick from that person than if you are standing outside on a porch with them uh, because, it, because of the increased air ventilation and air turnover. So you're bringing in that, you have more fresh air basically coming in. Um, and then also CO2 levels of 1400 parts per million or more can lead to a 50% decrease in cognitive function. So normal CO2 levels are a little over 250 parts per million. So it just shows you how high it can build up. Um, and this really derives from not having enough fresh air being brought into the facility through your HVAC system. And then also many short-term and long-term health effects that I had touched on in the prior slide. Uh, may appear from exposure to VOCs or volatile organic compounds in a poorly ventilated facility. So you need to make sure you're having the proper amount of what we call fresh air turnover, where you're bringing in more and more outside air to replace the polluted indoor air that can build up over time. And then talking about that from a building perspective, how an HVAC system affects the IQ. Um, so improper air turnover, so if you're not bringing in enough fresh air, it can lead to negative building pressure, as Darren had talked about earlier. And by having a negative building pressure, that can cause infiltration of unconditioned air through small holes or cracks in your facility, or even like front doors, an open window, anything like that. So if you were to open that door, a gust of wind of unconditioned, non-dehumidified, non-conditioned air would flow into the facility. And that can lead to, you know, that can lead to warmer spots or colder spots, depending on the time of year. A good um, kind of description I always like to think of is if you're at a restaurant, um, not right now, of course, but in, you know, the winter time, January, December, and you're out to eat and someone opens that front door and you feel that really cold gust of wind, it's because that building has a negative building pressure. Um, and by having that, you cause that infiltration of that unconditioned cold air. Um, and then, but on the, the opposite side of that outside air intake, if you have too much of that, it can affect the relative humidity um, and lead to condensation and that can collect and cause organic growth and water damage. So if you're bringing in too much of that fresh air, then the system can't properly condition it. And then you have just a higher relative humidity and moisture in your air. 
um, and in your facility. Uh, and then also equipment not set to these design set points uh, can create high energy use in the facility as well as shortened equipment life. A good example of this is a lot of motors have FLA, which is full load amps. That's the maximum amount of amps it's supposed to run at. If it's running above that, first off, you're spending more energy uh, to power that motor. But then on top of it, the motor's not meant to run at that amount of amps, so it will burn out unnecessarily earlier. So you're paying more money over the life cycle of that because you're going to have to you know, regularly replace it and fix that. So then going into some of the causes of bad, I, bad, bad IAQ, sorry. Um, so I mentioned some of these items uh, earlier, but um, too little fresh air intake, that's when you're not uh, bringing enough fresh air, of course, but this can lead to the lack of that fresh air turnover. Um, and a good example of this is that the average human ex exhales about 2.3 pounds of carbon dioxide per day. So if you have an office with 120 people, 500 people, however many, you just need to think about how much carbon dioxide is really building up in that facility. And if you're not properly ventilating that properly, you can end up with higher levels of CO2. And as I had mentioned before, higher levels of CO2 can lead to a decreased cognitive function. Um, and then also many products in a facility uh, give off toxins um, you know, or, or VOCs. So whether it's the glue that's holding your furniture together or your cleaning supplies in the closet. So you wanna make sure you're having that air uh, replaced with fresh air that isn't polluted with those airborne toxins. Uh, but then conversely, you can have too much fresh air intake in a facility. So you need to make sure you have it balanced properly um, because if you're bringing in too much, it can cause damage to the building, furniture, equipment, electronics by having that higher moisture. And then also it can lead to higher energy costs if you're bringing in too much fresh air because your equipment is working harder than it needs to to condition all of that air being pulled in. And then also volatile organic compounds or VOCs. So these are harmful gases that are emitted from specific solids or liquids. And I think the good way of thinking about that really is if you open up your like cleaning cabinet or a closet and you get that whiff of like the Clorox wipes and the floor cleaner, that all has VOCs in it. Um, and you wanna just make sure that that's being properly ventilated um, a lot of times, if you look in commercial facilities, you will actually see small exhaust fans in broom closets to make sure the bleach and the other cleaning materials are actually being exhausted. So just an example of VOCs. Um, and these are actually all uh, issues that we have found um, while, on various while at various facilities uh, that can lead to poor indoor air quality. Um, so I think this first photo uh, really speaks for itself. Uh, if you are cooking and your ventilation is not properly exhausting that smoke, you're going to lead to poor smoke capture and just smoke buildup in the facility. Um, and I don't know, I just don't think that looks good, nor does it smell good. If you're an occupant in there, I think that's a real red flag. I would honestly think that the building's probably on fire if I was sitting in a dining room and I saw that smoke kind of rolling out. Um, but then some more uh, kind of lesser known and less obvious items, uh, flex duct detached. So this is the ductwork up in the ceiling that you may not be able to see, providing that air to different areas in the facility. So if, you're not have, if that's detached, you're not getting the proper airflow and air turnover into those areas that was this, um, as it was originally designed. And then Darren had mentioned one of the uh, functions of an HVAC system is to also filter the air. Well, when you see a clogged filter like this, uh, that is very dirty. Um, that, those need to be cleaned and replaced to allow for that air to properly be cleaned and properly be filtered as it's entering the facility or as it's being recirculated through the facility. And then uh, the bottom um, left corner, um, you see the backdraft dampers are obstructed. So the backdraft damper, the purpose of that is if you think of an exhaust fan, so that's pulling air out of the facility. The backdraft damper's purpose is to let the air go out of the facility, but not come back into the facility. And in this photo, you can see there's conduit that's blocking it from opening and closing properly. So in a scenario like this, air could actually be flowing back into the facility that's not been conditioned, that's not been properly filtered, um, and that can just lead to a number of problems that I had mentioned before. Um, and then the economizer missing, this is actually a huge issue. Um, this is a major issue. So when we're talking about the fresh air turnover and bringing in that fresh air, this is really where it's coming from. 
So any of the spaces that are conditioned by this unit are not getting that proper fresh air because it was never installed. Um, you just see that sheet metal right there. There should be dampers that are opening up and closing, letting in more or less outside air. And then uh, missing volume damper. These are actually at the grill level. So if you look up um, in your facility and you see where the air is coming out, there should be a volume damper just uh, past that. And the volume damper is gonna be opening or closing um, to allow more or less air into that space. And that kind of goes along with the flex duct attached that I had mentioned um, where it's not bringing the proper amount of ventilation into that space. And then improper installation. Uh, this is a little hard to see, so we put those red lines there, uh, but that is an exhaust fan. So that could be exhaust air from a kitchen or from a bathroom or just polluted air in the facility elsewhere and um, it is not properly set I don't know if you can see my cursor here but it's really not properly set so it's being it's overhanging there so you're not getting the proper amount of static pressure actually in that ductwork so it's not pulling that air actually out of the facility it's going to be pulling the air from outside through that gap back out so you're really not getting that proper suction through the facility, which can lead to a buildup of more of that polluted air inside the facility. Um, and then this is an example here, this exposed wiring. This is from a, actually a kitchen hood. So this is pulling uh, the grease kind of uh, smoke from a cooking surface. So this grease is building up here and you actually have this exposed wiring, um, which can also lead the motor to short. This is actually also a fire hazard, um, but, by having that motor short, um, then you are also not getting that proper air being pulled out of the facility, specifically of a kitchen type, um, in this example, a kitchen type uh, scenario. And then uh, frozen evaporator coil. Uh, we like to refer to this as the most expensive ice on earth. Uh, that's a little bit of a joke that we throw around internally a lot. Um, but if you can see that the, the actual belt that goes from the motor to the fan is loose, so it's not properly pulling the air into the facility. I've actually been on a facility that had this, and um, we noticed that all of this ice right here that was building up on these cooling coils because there wasn't proper airflow over it to pull that cold air. Um, that ice was melting during the day. Uh, this was down in Louisiana, so it was getting pretty hot. That ice was melting during in the middle of the day and actually traversing along the ductwork and falling out of the ceiling. So when we first showed up on site, they actually were having a roofer come out later that day to fix their roofing, when in actuality it was an issue with their HVAC system where their belt wasn't properly tensioned onto their fan blade. Um, and that was leading to excess water in the facility and also not enough conditioned air. So it was very hot in there and very uncomfortable. And then this dirty RT blower wheel here, this photo, so that shows just that buildup that can happen over time on an RTU or rooftop unit. So that's gonna get clogged up and you're gonna get less airflow into the facility um, over the life of that fan if it's not properly cleaned and maintained. And then we see here, poor sensor location. So out of this grill, this is gonna be cool or hot air being pulled in um, through your RTU. So it's shooting out here. And you have a thermostat sensor located right there. So it is constantly detecting um, this change in temperature over and over. And it's not gonna properly give you an accurate temperature reading on the facility. So it's always gonna think it's colder or warmer than it actually is. So you wanna have that located in a proper area to make sure that the unit isn't constantly turning off and on or switching between heating and cooling. And you're getting the proper temperature that you should be getting in the facility. And then, uh, this is probably one of my favorite photos and also probably one of the grossest ones that we have. This is from a very real example. I mean, this is a very real facility. Um, there was bird debris on the unit or in the unit too. Um, a whole flock of birds seemed to have nested in the unit. And this was actually a restaurant type facility. So it was pulling this air over um, this dead bird and then into a facility where there was cooking going on. So you need to make sure that this isn't happening. You can only imagine what kind of diseases and bacteria we're building up there. Um, and that's just gives you an idea of just some of the kinds of issues that we really do see out on sites um, that can lead to poor indoor air quality. Um, and it really varies. So 
now that I was all doom and gloom, uh, going over some ways to actually improve the indoor air quality of your facility. Um, so not sure if you can tell, but that photo right there is actually one of Darren Witter um, because he's famous. He's our model for most of our marketing photos. Um, but so a good way to improve your IQ is just keeping up with preventative maintenance checkpoints. A lot of those items that I had just gone through, those could be easily prevented just by having a proper PM schedule and having people properly clean and maintain the units as they should. Um, also having a test and balance to provide a true snapshot of the facility and the condition of it. So you, that'll make sure you're also getting the proper air flows to the correct areas of the facility. Um, Darren mentioned this earlier, but you could have an IAQ flush out. And this is where we open up or where you open up the outside air dampers in the facility um, to the max 100%. And that's letting uh, the most amount of outside air into the building. And you do this for a certain prescribed amount of time in a certain amount. And the idea is to essentially replace all of the air inside the facility with completely fresh air. Um, and this is um, a great way just to replace all that polluted air that may be building, building up in the facility. Um, holding your contractors accountable and reworking equipment under warranty. I mentioned that backtrap damper um, that was obstructed by the conduit. If that's something that is um, wrong at the facility, if that's an issue that's been noted, make sure to hold your contractors accountable and get that fixed because that's a very uh, simple thing that could cause issues down the road. And you wanna make sure that those are uh, alleviated really at the onset of construction or as soon as you're noticing them. And then also maintaining peace of mind by monitoring and staying proactive with building health. There's a number of ways you can monitor um, the actual health of the facility and get the temperature, humidity, CO2, all these types of things can be measured. Um, so you have, you really can diagnose what's going on in the facility. Um, and then also air quality tests for VOCs or those volatile organic compounds or other harmful, harmful particles um, can be good. There's these things called SUMA canisters um, that you can have placed in a facility and they will, take readings of the air, they'll take actually I think uh, particulate kind of samples of the air and then those will be checked in a lab and can give you an idea of the condition in the facility um, and a very accurate and a very real snapshot of the air. Um, and then also improving energy efficiency um, within these same systems. So implementing energy recovery systems to capture and reuse return air. So the way that an energy recovery system works is that the air that you would normally be exhausting out of the facility, that's already at the temperature or close to the temperature that you want your facility at. So instead of just exhausting that to the outside world um, with that wasted energy, the idea is to run that air um, through a heat exchanger for your air that's coming into the facility. So that way that heat that's coming out can be transferred to the air that's coming in before it's actually cooled or heated through um, the rooftop system or the HVAC system. So that way you're able to reduce your energy costs and you're kind of recapturing a lot of that, that heating and cooling that you're already spending money on. And then installing high efficiency equipment and systems. Equipment's getting more efficient every day, every year. Um, so just make sure you're trying to stay on top of that. And then utilize economizers or free cooling modes. So for a free cooling mode, um, you need to think like in the fall and in the spring, where if you're trying to uh, have your indoor building temperature at 70 degrees, and the temperature outside is 70 degrees, what it can do is it can open your outside air damper or your economizer to 100% and let in all of, like pretty much as much air as possible. And because that temperature is the same temperature as the air in the facility, you're not spending money to heat and cool it during those times of the year when the outside air is essentially the same temperature as the indoor air should be. Um, and then relaxing temperature controls during peak season. This is something we do a really good job at, at Malink. So in the winter time, you aren't necessarily heating it to the same uh, temperature that you would normally, but maybe a few degrees lower. So you're saving that during the peak season and then we'll all bring in coats and we have little uh, kind of panel heaters at our desks as a way to stay warm. Um, it's not that bad, I promise. We, uh, we're not like bundled up wearing coats or uh, wearing gloves or anything. Um, but then also verifying proper airflow in all spaces of the facility. So making sure you're getting that proper ventilation and also making sure you're not having, you know, any motors that are running higher or lower than they need to. Um, because if they're overrunning, 
again, that could burn them out, and you're also spending money for those motors to run at a higher speed. Um, and then reviewing the control programming and calibration. Something we actually see a lot is facilities being in an unoccupied mode, which is where the temperature may be lower or higher because there's no one in the facility. Sometimes we will see facilities where the unoccupied setting actually is turning on when people are in the facility. And that's a simple programming thermostat calibration that can be fixed. Um, and it can lead to a more comfortable facility. Then it can also lead to proper energy savings during the off hours. So some benefits of good IQ. I've kind of touched on this throughout the whole presentation. Um, but just kind of as a recap, really employee health, promoting that um, good air really for your employees, uh, compl compliance, avoiding litigation, um, and complying with regulations, all of those that Darren had mentioned earlier, all those standards, great to stay in line with those. Um, and then as we had mentioned that CO2, higher levels of CO2 can lead to decreases in quality. You're creating a pleasant work environment, maximizing efficiency and minimizing sick days. And then also you are built, uh, you're helping with your building upkeep. You know, you're not replacing motors when you don't need to. You're not having organic growth damage or anything like that. It's, you're just having a very clean, efficient facility. And that also leads into cost savings by extending the life of your equipment through the regular upkeep. So your motors or really your units aren't overworking. Um, when really they might just need a good cleaning or their filters might need to be replaced. So. And really, that leads to the end here. Any questions? Let's see if I can pull up the chat here without messing up too badly. I don't seem to be able to pull that up. Oh, there we go. Yep, so I don't see any um, questions yet. Um, but also, if you guys have any questions that are lingering, uh, feel free to call us, 513-965-7300. Uh, both of our emails are here, uh, Cameron Leonard and Darren Witter. Um, or you can actually go on our website. We have an online request form that you can fill out, um, and we'll get back to you um, as soon as possible. If anybody wants to ask a question at this time, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Must have done a really good job. I, have a, I have a question. <laughs> okay. Um, what is a good schedule for maintenance um, for testing the equipment? Dan, would you like to take that one? Sure, good question. So the, the maintenance schedule really will depend on the type of equipment and the hours of operation of a facility. So um, for example, the, the, the longer a building is open, a 24 hour operation versus maybe a 14 hour operation, uh, the longer the equipment's running, the more maintenance, the uh, more frequent the maintenance will be needed. Uh, but also what's happening inside the building, uh, how clean is the operations, uh, maybe a um, an office building versus a manufacturing facility, for example, where you're going to be producing more contaminants inside the building, then you'll need more frequent maintenance. Uh, but on average, uh, typically there's quarterly maintenance that should be done. Again, it could be um, more often in some cases, but an average is probably quarterly where there's some, some basic things that should be done, like um, replacing air filters, um, checking belts, uh, more so just spot checking the, the, the system so that if something is, is falling out of spec, uh, it can be addressed proactively before it becomes a serious problem. And then there's more maintenance that's done on an, on an annual basis that might be more intensive. Um, but as a, as a quick answer, I would say quarterly is probably um, a good cycle to be on. Good question. Thank you. And actually just um, kind of adding on to Darren's, uh, with a lot of uh, the stuff going on currently um, and people not actually working in their facilities and people working mm -hmm. from home, 
um, this is a very good time, I'd say, to make sure that there's someone or some way that you are making sure the facility isn't really, I want to say falling into disrepair. That sounds a little extreme, but um, you want to make sure that there aren't items that would normally be alleviated by people being in there. So maybe there's uh, some water dripping through the ceiling. You want to make sure that that's not, uh, and someone normally would clean that up without thinking twice about it. Um, but you want to make sure that while no one's in the facility, that is something that is being monitored and isn't kind of going on, um, going ignored. And I actually see we also just got a question um, through the chat um, about is there any way to measure building pressure with technology? Uh, there actually is. Um, Malink, actually this past year, uh, we released our positive system which is an indoor and an outdoor uh, sensor that measures building pressure, temperature, humidity, humidity as well as CO2, um, and reports it to a portal. So that allows people to really remotely diagnose um, a building pressure, or just the condition of the facility. Um, but if you're also just, you know, if it's just one facility, let's say one office building, you can also get like updates on your phone, you can check it on your phone or on your computer um, regularly through that technology. Anything else? All right. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I guess, you know, thank you for, for letting us present. I really appreciate it. Um, and if anyone, again, has any questions or comments, you know, please feel free to follow up. Uh, me and Darren will be happy to answer any further questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Cameron. Thank you, Darren. We appreciate it. Thank you Thank all you. for those, Thank you. those that joined today as well. We appreciate you guys being able to, to join us. Thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone. You too. Take care.